that are so important to Red Hook. And so we're very excited about it, but also very challenged because although 5,000 sounds like a lot of money, we had asked for 20. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a slight shortfall, which we hope that we can uh, make up. And uh, so we're going to start a major campaign, trying not to bother most of you and trying to uh, go after perhaps some foundation money or some other uh, corporate funds and then see where we wind up. But uh, it's, it's a major challenge, but one worth doing, we think. So we're going to do it. Uh, under new business, in the, uh, hi Cynthia, hi. welcome. Uh, on the table in the middle room, we have uh, two new issues of Maynard Ham's paper of 100 years ago. Uh, the one of them for the second half of February will be of particular interest because it's a wonderful <coughs> picture of the ice house in Barrytown. Uh, they didn't put photographs like that in the newspaper a hundred years ago, but it came across Maynard's desk and he says, I've got to add this in, even though it wasn't in the original paper, because it does have a lot of information in it about ice. And ice was very important in the winter. And so our next meeting, <coughs> which will be on February 27th, will focus on ice, ice harvesting, and also playing around on the ice, which is what they also like to do. But um, very much a part of the life in this part of the country. Don't you want to come and sit down? Come on. That's the young innkeeper back there. Really should have for him to see. The old one's sitting down. <laughs> if they're in the room, I hope they are. There's Shirley. I want to thank Mary Kelly and Shirley Brown for taking on the refreshments, uh, the organizing of the refreshments. I saw Mary <coughs> Chaffee walking in with a plate of her wonderful food, and we really appreciate it. And thanks to anybody else who happened to bring some, some homemade to add to our stash. Everybody does enjoy the social hour afterwards, and we appreciate the contributions that come in. We're not very good about calling you up and saying, will you bring it tonight? We just hope you will. I wanted to show you one thing. Uh, we did finally get our newsletter out, thanks to help from Steve Lawson. And I know that there are a few grandmothers in the room. So I have to show you this very briefly. I can pass it around. Uh, some of you know Steve's mother and father. Uh, and this is a book he did at the request of his mother, something to pass to the grandchildren so they would know about the people who came before them. And it's a short text with lots of wonderful pictures. And it shows you what you can do on a computer these days, creating something really charming to pass on to the next generation. And it's all on sturdy paper so the kids can, you know, if they get their sticky hands on it, you can wipe it off. But really neat. And uh, so. I can pass that around. I just have to give it back to Steve at some point. Um, we have on the table outside a collection of sonnets of Chandler Chapman. As many of you know, in the Barrytown Explorer, he often published sonnets that he wrote. And um, it was a very important side of him. And uh, was it Victor Chapman who collected those together? I don't know. Yes. We, yeah, and uh, he provided, uh, Winnie loaned us a set of these, and so we duplicated them, and we have them available. We are asking for a dollar donation to cover the cost of the paper, and thanks to Paula Schoonmaker for doing the physical labor of standing over a hot copy machine, running them off and stapling them for us. We really appreciate that. It's not a comprehensive collection. It's a, it's a small sampling of yes. Chandler's. <laughs> Exactly. Well, some of them are really charming, and most of them are dated, so you'll know what paper they appeared in. One last uh, thing, Amy Armbruster is here. She's from the Tivoli Bays Information Center, and uh, she just wanted to make a remark and a request. So, Amy? Hello. My name is Amy Armbruster. I work for the Tivoli Bays Visitor Center, which is run by the New York State DEC and the Village of Tivoli. <coughs> um, we're designing a whole new exhibit for the space. 
which is located next to the library in the town building in Tivoli. And I was, I stopped by to some of you and asked you if you'd fill out some of these surveys. And I know some of you did, and I appreciate it. But I'm going to leave some outside. Um, so after the meeting, if you guys would like to fill out a survey to give me more input on, into this project so that it can be a community resource and that it will feature things that you are interested in. Um, if you'd like to fill it out, I'll leave some of them with some pens and you can do it after the talk tonight. Thanks. Uh, it's always interesting of all this political stuff you hear about AmeriCorps. Amy came here as an AmeriCorps volunteer, so I think you should know the quality of people who are in the AmeriCorps and serving communities, and not all of them are in depressed communities. Some of them are in our own community, and we're very happy to have Amy here. Thanks. And now, before there was a Chandler Chapman, there was Peter Schuyler. <coughs> and this is a wonderful print of a painting by Nehemiah Partridge, which uh, Wendy Aldridge managed to find in the collection of the city of Albany, where it hangs in the office of the mayor. And this is so beautiful, I think we must have this frame that hung in this room, along with Egbert Benson, because before there was an Egbert Benson, there was a Peter Schuyler. So this is really the, the who he was. He owned all this land. This was his friend. <laughs> I thought everybody knew who Peter Schuyler was. But anyhow, it's, it's a wonderfully handsome painting, and we appreciate this very much. This is, this is just wonderful. Really All of what is today the town of Red Hook was given by King James II to Colonel Schuyler in 1688. That's why his picture will be here. <laughs> we put him safely over here so he doesn't get in the Six to eight. 
embarrassing, but Steve oh, Fisher, you guys stand up. Yeah, it's quite amazing. You know where Chandler was for years ago. Tell one brief story. Is it time for stories? Oh, sure. Uh, we we had the good fortune to be married at Sylvania, and we went to visit Chandler in the hospital. He was in the hospital at the time, quite sick, and uh, we asked him, could we do that? We were living in one of his houses on the property, and he had only one clear answer. He said, "My mother would be delighted." <laughs> so we were married in Sylvania, and then we had two sons, and one of them, Deirdre, who's my wife, used to throw him up in the air by the pool. And Chandler said, stop that, you'll make that boy fearless. <laughs> I'll start by saying that Chandler Chapman would say about all of this, it's a load of bourgeois. <laughs> and he would have loved it because he was not without ego. Uh, but just to, to put him in the, uh, uh, in the historical uh, context, um, those of us who observe such things will observe his centennial on the 27th of April this year. He'll be 100 years old uh, this April, which uh, uh, since he seems to have been a presence in our midst uh, really very recently, it seems amazing to, to consider that. He was the son of John J. Chapman, who was uh, a very eminent man, a political reformer, an attorney who didn't practice in New York, uh, somebody who first championed and then reviled Theodore Roosevelt for being a political uh, compromiser, um, uh, and who went on uh, to, to be a, a, an eminent man of letters, an essayist, um, a translator, a poet, a dramatist, uh, and he lived here in our midst uh, from about 1901 until his death in 1933. Uh, his influence on Chandler Chapman, his, his youngest son, was, uh, I think, enormous. Chandler never really emerged from his father's shadow. He, he wanted, I think, all his life to somehow to measure up, but he was also always, always uh, competing in some fashion with his father. Uh, but he did in his own way, uh, end up being a writer, uh, being a man of action, as his father had been, uh, but in a different in a different sense. Now Chandler's mother uh, was uh, a Chandler from Rokeby, uh, one of the eleven children who grew up there as orphans, and on her marriage as a second wife to John J. Chapman in, in 1897, uh, a few years after they decided to settle. Uh, in her hometown and bought the Donaldson Place in Barrytown. And uh, by 1905 had uh, built Sylvania, a beautiful house designed by Charles Park, and some outbuildings and established a, uh, a farm there as a going concern. Uh, and it was uh, there that uh, Chandler grew up. He was uh, born in New York City, but he grew up at Barrytown. And uh, uh, I think always liked the country life, always liked uh, the notion of of being on a farm and being of a farm, um, but he didn't spend all his time there. Uh, he, they lived in New York City as well, and he was educated there and in St. Paul's School in New Hampshire. Uh, music played an important part uh, in his growing up years. He was uh, encouraged to play the violin. I don't imagine he played it very well, but he all his life was interested in music. He wrote musical criticism and the Explorer and uh, went to concerts and was very intelligent about, uh, uh, about the performance of music. Um, uh, his years at St. Paul's School uh, were spotty, to put it mildly, and he wonderfully described it uh, in 1940 in a book published by Putnam's The Wrong Attitude, or A Bad Boy at a Good School. <laughs> it's the only book that Chandler Chapman uh, wrote and published, uh, uh, I'm sorry to say, because I think that he had other books in it. Um, but uh, uh, he describes uh, his efforts to get fired from the school and, and, uh, and his father's efforts to persuade the headmaster uh, 
to uh, disregard <coughs> these attempts. Uh, and, uh, and so he, he uh, to his great chagrin, I think, uh, remained there until he graduated and went on to Harvard. One of the things that really colored his, his teenage years uh, was the death in 1916 of his beloved oldest brother, half-brother, actually, Victor Chapman, uh, an American aviator uh, flying for France before we entered the war, um, was shot down uh, over France in, in, the, in June of 1916. And uh, uh, much was made of this. This was not merely a personal loss uh, to the family, uh, but it was celebrated throughout the land as, as a, a modern knight uh, uh, dying uh, for freedom, dying for civilization. Uh, and it inspired uh, other young men to go and do likewise, not to die necessarily, but to volunteer uh, to help the Allied cause. And of course, within a few months, we had ended the war ourselves. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Chapman Sr. were, were at the, in the vanguard of, of uh, encouraging that Victor's sacrifice be, be seen as, as a, an inspiration to others uh, and, uh, and uh, rallying the cause of, of defeating the uh, uh, the Kaiser's Germany. Uh, Chandler was too young to get into the war, and, and this bothered him mightily. It's one of the reasons he wanted to get out of his boarding school. Um, and then by the time uh, he was old enough, the war was over. Uh, he went to Harvard. I'm not sure that he graduated. Uh, I don't think he graduated. Um, and he was sort of crashing around. He was taken up by his colorful uncle, Bob Chandler, who was a politician and an artist. And that wasn't uh, terribly good for his, uh, his uh, moral uh, life. <laughs> <laughs> and so his parents uh, hurried him into a uh, marriage with uh, a member of the James family, Olivia James, who was a great niece, the novelist Henry James, and the psychologist William James. Um, uh, she also was, I think by that time, the sister-in-law of a, a budding sculptor named Alexander Calder. Um, called her having married uh, uh, her sister, uh, uh, Miss James. Uh, they were to have four children, and we're delighted that their oldest son, Jay, is, is here this evening. Uh, uh, another son, Robert, who died a few years ago, and lived at the end of his life in, in Rhinecliffe, and two daughters, Mariah, who's still alive, and, and uh, Elizabeth, who died as a child. Um, Chandler went to work as a journalist, uh, for the Springfield Republican in Massachusetts and uh, uh, learned something about newspapering there. Uh, wasn't terribly happy with the, with the work. Uh, and uh, some years later, uh, found him working for G.P. Putnam's, uh, uh, the book publisher in New York City. Um, but that didn't work out very well either. And during the 30s, his father died in 1933, um, and his mother moved into uh, the smaller house in Sylvania, which they had built in the 1930s, known as Good Half, uh, and handing over the big house and the operation of the farm to Chandler. So he really gave up uh, his outside uh, employment uh, by the uh, <coughs> mid to late 1930s uh, and raised his family uh, uh, in, uh, in, in part, anyhow, at uh, Sylvania, at the main house, uh, at least during the, uh, during the summer. Um, uh, the dairy farm, uh, and he became very serious about dairying, um, was, a, was a Holstein herd. And uh, before long, Chandler was active in the Dairyman's League, um, uh, fighting the, uh, the middleman and fighting the, uh, uh, the big uh, uh, milk uh, sellers and distributors, New York City, Bordens, and the others, uh, get a better price for the, for the dairyman. Uh, and he also operated his own milk route for a while. It was for a while, it was over in Connecticut, and then I think it was closer to home. Uh, uh, and uh, he had good people certainly helping him uh, run the farm there, the Bloomers and, and Sisms and others. But uh, uh, Chandler was accident prone all his life. And I can remember being told by my parents uh, that they certainly didn't want to see happen uh, next door at Rokeby, the sort of things that happened in Sylvania, where the proprietor would, on a regular basis, overturn the tractor on those steep side hills. And on one occasion, uh, I suppose he was plowing, and maybe he'd been uh, celebrating this before he was plowing, I don't know, but uh, the tractor overturned and he 
was an inveterate cigar smoker in those days, the cigar had gone out about 30 seconds before the tractor overturned, uh, splashing uh, the contents of the gasoline tank all over him and pinioning him there until finally people realized where is Mr. Chapman? And they went looking for him and found him, and they were able to get him out from his fix and get the tractor uh, turned back upside down. He would have been, of course, incinerated had, uh, had uh, uh, his guardian angel not been looking out for him. He did this, maybe not always with the, uh, with the lighted cigar, on three or four occasions. <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure that his insurance uh, carrier <laughs> knew about it, but. Uh, but uh, much earlier in his life, he had, uh, he had uh, uh, shipped on as a crew on a cousin's uh, ill-fated venture of sailing uh, across the Atlantic from, uh, from east to west uh, on the Shanghai, I think it was called. It was a, it was a sloop of, of some description that um, had, uh, no, it must have been a, a small schooner. But they had, I think, everybody on board they had never done anything like this before. They didn't know where they were going or how to sail. <laughs> and uh, they ended up um, either having to abandon the ship or, or anyway, Chandler got, uh, was a castaway on a rocky, uh, small island off Nova Scotia somewhere. I mean, he was pretty sure. <laughs> as being the most impossible member of an impossible crew, I don't know. But it was written up in a book, and Chandler himself told the story of the last cruise of the Shanghai, uh, somewhere here in the Baritan Explorer. And, uh, he was shipwrecked. Was it in fact that the whole vessel was lost? Yes, they knew they were in deep trouble. They let down the anchor with all the chain and waited until it caught on something. <laughs> once gave me a small metal tube with a top that could be screwed on tight and had a little cork lining or something. And he said, you know what this is? And I said, no, and I was playing with it. And he said, well, you're a damn fool you don't know what this is. You put safety matches in there, kitchen matches. And I said, yes, then what? And he said, well, you keep them dry. It saved my life when I was a castaway. <laughs> I never had occasion to use it. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't finished with those waters up there, and in 1940 he decided that he could, remembering uh, his brother's sacrifice in the first war, that he could do something for free, free France, because by then France had, had uh, been invaded by the Germans, and the, uh, the collaborationist government had uh, made, or were making a separate peace with Hitler, and uh, it offended him that there was a piece of metropolitan France in North America. The islands of Saint Pierre and Miquelon, uh, all of Newfoundland, and uh, and when uh, he spoke to his neighbor Franklin Roosevelt about this, Roosevelt just laughed and waved him aside. And not, had more important things to worry about. But Chandler decided that if the government wouldn't do something about this, the Canadian government wouldn't do something about it, he would. And, and I believe that he, when he couldn't find other people to help him, he decided to invade these two islands alone. <laughs> I don't know how well defended they were, but in fact, uh, word, word got to FDR and the, and the authorities. And somewhere in the middle of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, Chandler was forced to turn back. <laughs> and uh, those two small islands were, were safe uh, uh, for the French, whichever French government controlled them, uh, uh, I guess for the remainder of the war. I'm not sure what happened to them. But, but I, I found in Sylvania after his death a very detailed maps of the Gulf of St. Lawrence with large arrows <laughs> pointing to these very small fishing islands. <laughs> circled and uh, <laughs> so uh, this was more than a rumor that, that Chandler did, did in fact try to invade, uh, invade uh, the islands uh, in Canada. Um, during the war, of course, this war came and he was too old now to really join up after we entered the war and even before then he decided to join the American Field Service which was uh, uh, an agency that in those days, now of course is one of the exchange programs for students, but, but then it was uh, for uh, people who were prepared to, uh, uh, to help uh, the injured, 
and the sick uh, on the battlefield with ambulances and, and uh, getting them back to their field clinics and so forth. Um, uh, and uh, some of the people who served in the field service were, uh, for, for reasons of their moral scruples, did not choose to, to fight. Others, like Chandler, were too old or, or were disqualified uh, serving in the armed forces for other reasons. Uh, Chandler served in <coughs> North Africa, I think in Libya, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. For a bit, had, uh, had kind of a rough time, came home, uh, then signed up for another hitch in Burma. And on his way to Burma, and he did eventually get there, but it was very roundabout, uh, he was uh, shipping aboard as supercargo, as passengers, on a freighter uh, uh, carrying uh, ammunition to the uh, North African theater, I guess. I'm not sure where the freighter was going. But to avoid the U-boats uh, in convoy, he went down around Florida and around the Caribbean and was going to get down to Brazil and then go across the, the South Atlantic. And uh, they were torpedoed uh, somewhere north of Trinidad or Tobago. Um, and he wrote about that with great, uh, uh, I mean, it really is a marvelous account. It's called 1,600 tons of cordite, uh, cordite being the high explosive that they were carrying. Uh, I don't remember whether it blew up. I don't think it blew up. It just sank. I mean, it, but it sank very quickly, and he and some of the crew uh, survived to spend uh, many days in an open lifeboat, and finally were picked up and taken to British Guiana, and then got back to uh, back to New York. Uh, he wrote it up for Life magazine. Uh, there were some photographs that were taken perhaps when the light bulb was being, being picked up. And uh, uh, he told me that he, he was paid enough for it so that he could, he could get a good meal and a new suit, and then he was off again to Burma. <laughs> uh, but he survived the war, and he came back. And I, I remember saying to him once, in connection with all of these things, the overturned tractors and the shipwrecks and the, and the torpedoing of his vessel, that. Uh, that uh, he seemed to really attract danger and, and accidents. And, uh, and he said, nothing, nothing compared in terms of uh, the distress that it caused, or the concern, or the worry, or the agitation, uh, to serving on the New York Central School Board. <laughs> <laughs> Which he did <laughs> for some time in the, in the 40s and 50s, and he also served on the uh, uh, as a board, uh, the board of trustees of Bard College, which must have also been somewhat agitating. Um, but in any event, uh, in, the, in the late 40s, uh, he and Olivia Chapman were divorced, and he married Helen Riesenfeld, who was an accomplished uh, a journalist herself, worked for Look Magazine for some years, uh, and uh, they settled in at Barrytown. Uh, their son, Victor Chapman, uh, was born uh, about 1949. And I know he'd send his, his best wishes, and he provided this, this tape. Uh, I think he didn't know when he sent it that there was going to be an event like this, but uh, uh, I wrote him, and I know he's very happy uh, that uh, his father, who he's very fond of, is being remembered by the community tonight. Um, but the, the great thing that happened at the end of, uh, toward, in the last years of Chandler's life, of course, was, was Helen Chapman persuading him uh, to uh, start their own newspaper. And the Barrytown Explorer <coughs> published for 25 years to the issue, uh, from 19, well, to 1982, whatever, that's 57, I guess. From 1957 to 82, it was named in honor of one of the early space shots, and uh, uh, it was like no other publication anywhere in the world. Uh, Chandler saw to that as publisher, and, uh, and Helen saw to that as editor. And, uh, it, it, uh, it enjoyed a good uh, circulation, and uh, I'm pleased to say that some years ago the State Library arranged to have the entire run of Explorer's microfilm, so they are they're preserved in that form, but uh, uh, I think I have the complete run, Helen Chapman's set, bound, uh, and, uh, and I'm sure that the Historical Society does as well. So, so that resource is, is available uh, to us. Um, he also had the radio show that, uh, that Barbara mentioned uh, for several years that promoted the Explorer, but it also was a good deal of fun. In fact, he didn't broadcast live. He'd go around with a tape recorder like that and, and tape people, and then he'd tape the, uh, the commercials, and, and, uh, and uh, that was fun for him. And sonnets, he was churning out for a 
I think much of his life, uh, and he got really pretty good at it. And uh, one of them, I think, could be played tonight is is uh, is one of his very best. Uh, in the last five years, uh, well, no, about 19, uh, 1975, I think, he married Ida Holzberg Wagman, and uh, they remained married, sort of, uh, for the rest of his life. I guess they were technically divorced by the time Chandler died. Um, and Chandler died in, in uh, March of 1982. I'll just close with a couple of, of stories. One uh, uh, that uh, that I like. Uh, about 1975, I guess, the phone rang at Goodhap and, and uh, Chandler answered it. And it was a reporter uh, for, the, for the Poughkeepsie Journal. Mr. Chapman? Yes. Um, Poughkeepsie Journal. What the hell do you want? <laughs> well, I'm reading uh, uh, Associated Press uh, copy from uh, Stockholm. It says here that Saul Bellow has won the Nobel Prize for Literature. What the hell is that to me? <laughs> well, Mr. Chapman, we understand that Mr. Bellow, when he was teaching at Bard as a young man, was your tenant uh, at Barrytown. Yeah? So what? <laughs> uh, well, uh, did you like having him as a tenant? No, that good for nothing. <laughs> so he became more colorful still. Well, we understand, Mr. Chapman, that uh, uh, we, it says here that uh, the, uh, the Nobel Committee uh, mentioned uh, especially uh, his early comic novel, Henderson the Rain King, uh, as one of the great masterworks of American 20th century literature. Um, and we understand that you are the model for that. No, that's, uh, no, oh, for, I'm sorry, I'm telling this wrong. Uh, first they said, are you the model for Henderson the Rain King? Absolutely not. I no, have nothing to do with it. He, he doesn't know what the hell he's writing. And, and uh, I, I have to think hard to remember the fellow. <laughs> and then they said, well, they specially mentioned this novel. Silence at the end of the phone. And then Chandler said, they specially men mentioned Henderson. <laughs> yes, uh, the particular, uh, singled out as his, as his very finest work. Well, yes, yes, it's true. <laughs> Many of you know of him. He wrote the, the Husk River, a natural and natural history, uh, and was a longtime senior editor and writer for Sports Illustrated. And Bob uh, got to know Chandler in connection with the publication of his book. Uh, Chandler, I think, interviewed him on the radio about it, and and he, Bob complained that the, that the editors had let some typos survive in the text. He was very upset about it. Chandler said. I don't give it another thought. That kind of thing happens to all of us all the time. It's like the Hudson River. You walk along the river as I do almost every day. There are old rubber tires and tin cans. It doesn't diminish the glory of this river. There they are. That's what your typos are. Chandler rather liked this article because it quoted Chandler verbatim, uh, paragraph after paragraph. And uh, he liked it so much that he ordered, uh, you know, several hundred copies. And he, and he took as many as he needed uh, in his little VW over to the high school shortly before commencement that year and instructed uh, the uh, uh, principal that one copy must be given to every graduating senior <laughs> or else their education would not be complete. <laughs> Whether he intended to go on doing that year after year, I don't know. But, uh, but that article was reprinted by Bob Boyle in a, in a book that's here called At the Top of Their Game, a collection of essays about colorful people. <coughs> I think with that, I'm going to subside. I've run on altogether too long. And, and if I may, I'll turn it to, to Ben Chandler, who has uh, his own recollections and something to read. Oh. Well, I, well. I'm not really a featured speaker in this thing. I was just, I just told Winnie that I had, I had brought with me a copy of something that I had written about Chandler. This is quite short, uh, because he and I both belong to a, a club in Boston called the Tavern Club, because <laughs> his father. 
was a member of at the same time, too. Yeah. And uh, at the Tavern Club, whenever somebody died, you, somebody had to run, uh, write something about them, and it was read out at the annual meeting, you know, the people who died. And they asked me to write a thing about him. And so I did that. And, um, and, and this is a part of what I said about him. Um, unpredictable, turbulent, overflowing with energy, both physical and intellectual, he was a veritable storm of a man. On his infrequent visits to the tavern club, he could be counted on to stir things up. <laughs> Anticipation of his arrival filled presiding officers with an uneasy mixture of apprehension and delight. <laughs> Dairy farmer and poet, newspaper publisher and classicist, adventurer and music critic, he was a man of broad but unharnessed talent. <laughs> In spite of his love affair with the Petrarchian sonnet, the verse form in which he expressed himself almost daily, and also <laughs> with the joy of reading out loud. He claimed to have read War and Peace three times, once to each of his wives. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and the chaplain was essentially a master conversationalist. Um, uh, it has been said of Chandler Chapman that he thought metaphorically, and certainly his conversation rushed out in images that were sometimes hard to follow. The day before he died, he suddenly said to me, the numbers are a lousy racket. You might win 10,000 bucks, you might not even get a dime. <laughs> I think it was his way of saying goodbye. <laughs> Shall we let him speak for himself? That makes sense, I think. And then Buzz. Yes, and then Buzz. After the tape. Well, yeah, well, I, I was coming to the end. I was in the car room. Dignified the finale, you know? Last week, uh, I went to the back of the catastrophe here in the Anna Valley, and Mrs. Chibb's husband was killed in an automobile accident, and uh, Mr. Hill died two years before, and my life only died a month ago. And I thought it would be pleasant to say something about her over the air. I thought a mention like that is really a little less than complimentary because it's stupid. We've got about three or four minutes. And she made this house what it is. She made me what I am. She made a very good time. Don't think that we didn't squabble and fight because we did all the time because she always had a, a, a peculiarly uh, unbending attitude towards perfection and quality. I'd say, well, you can throw quality in the dick if you want to get a laugh out of them, get them put a nickel in the pot of a dime and half a bucket. <laughs> no, not for her. So then she insisted that we stick along with the point and get better artists. And I had some pretty poor artists, but we get them a little better all the time. She developed this one, Jim, developed Y.K. Smith, who was a big shot in the Coca-Cola company. He wrote a very lovely, pungent, entertaining, thoughtful, discourse on mighty near anything, the love cycle of the flea. <laughs> good. Now, my wife insisted that I write some more of these poems and so forth and so on. I'm not going to end with this because it's a little long and it's a little goofy in sky, but then I'm get it today. It's not really, it's called Walk Slowly. Those who went near the end of them, you know, when you're no longer running the steeple chase, you're getting in the cheap. It's towards the end. Having only so many steps to take before you reach the line from which there is no turning back, walk slowly on in this, the only world you know. Not run or make a fuss, but walk at peace and so forsake the torment of the flesh. It should be blissful.
wish to welcome the inevitable kiss that seals the sleep from which you will not awake. You cry at birth when hunger makes you howl. This for love of wine has cut a deep path that scars the heart. This is a wound that burns no more. Your turn is up. Lie still. Your soul may flicker on when you are out of breath and cross the line from which no man returns. Well, you know, that isn't what you want to read in the barbecue. <laughs> 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 yeah, she's very nice. Hi, and then she, she's a pretty flat. I don't know what my dad makes plenty of noise jumping anywhere, but she guided me around a little thing of the 22 years. And my life begins like this, and it's very much improved. So much improved, I never believed it could change. But yeah. now that's all over. We're going right ahead. We're not going to stop. When you can't smile, quit. Oh, I did get one. Maybe I've got 30 seconds to run it in. Uh, the music we play is life, qualified by curiosity. I think that's all right. You don't have to play that piano again, dear. They know that this is the end of the program. <laughs> I really have had music. Henry Scott, when he started in the telephone company, he, ran, he even ran a piece called A Dial Tone. And he, he was very entertaining. He thought I'd play the piano and listen to all the rest of it. But this is our program. It's a little program. And you people have made me awful happy. And it's been a little dirty now. Goodbye. <laughs> Uh, we've got to have fun, otherwise it's hardly worthwhile um, doing this business. And I'm glad we're having more Broadway, because only a week or two ago we had you here, maybe three. And we had a, I read a poem. That wasn't a poem that I wrote for my wife. That was a rather dismal little piece. But she was appropriate for the occasion. Well, I got one here. Should I run the old point now, Phil? Why not be doing it? Let me be out of the way. Let me see the watch. I don't know how far we get them on. So this is called For Heaven. Come down, come when I am all alone, and let us put our happiness away. The game is over. We can no longer play. That which we had and lived and loved is gone. Gone forever. Now I have begun to understand the pitch there is no way for you to come to me. I should repay your loveliness doing as you have done. Let me be bright up to the bitter end. Let me be gentle when the wound is deep and full of fury when the hurt is straight. You have your place, I mine. And I will wait till time crowds in and picking moments creep to pull me down. God, give me such a friend. Well, you know, I think this will be the last time that we turn it all, um, I won't cut it in quite the right word. But, <laughs> well, thank you, Phil. So, uh, we're going to move right on now. Thank you, that's great. One day or amendment? Does that bring back memories, guys? Oh, yeah, it does. Yeah. 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 Buzz made a wonderful uh, contribution to the memorial issue of the Berrytown Explorer by collecting a lot of Chandler stories that uh, members of his family remembered. Not stories, uh, little uh, uh, sayings. 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 <coughs> speaking. Right. Would that be appropriate now? Yes, well, I think so. Well, um, incidentally, I once I was invited by a girl I'd seen born and grow up to read a poem at her a rather elaborate wedding, and I was the only person other than the clergyman in the program, and I finally kind of let my glasses back in it. In Madison Valley, this is in Massachusetts. I turned to the woman next to me and said, Why do I get I can't be blessed? They work perfectly. And so I pulled off the poem, all right. Uh, but um, I, 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 
forgot my glasses again tonight. And I saw my old friend Barbara, the neighbor, the next door neighbor, and Barbara's glasses work perfectly. Also, <laughs> because I wanted to read a few things. Uh, I'd like to just make a few remarks first. Uh, I, have a, I have a story to tell that I, I probably should not hear uh, about Chandler. It's very legitimate. Uh, and firsthand, my mother said, don't tell, this, she was an Edwardian, and don't tell off-color stories, especially in mixed company. <laughs> uh, it, 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 by her definition, it's an off-color story, but I think I'll risk it. The phone rang, and uh, it was Chandler, and he said, you got to come up right away. I said, what's the, what's the matter, John? Don't ask any questions, just come on up. <coughs> Well, I rushed up. We're next door neighbors. I rushed up, uh, and uh, this Chandler was alone. His various wives had died, and uh, he wanted, he needed help in the administration of an enema. <laughs> <laughs> They're 
Mots, M-O-T, French, they're, they are uh, little plays of wet corn on a wing. And none of my family remember these. We, we got a good many copies down. And uh, when the uh, uh, Barrytown Explorer Memorial issue was being prepared, Sam Reif, Reif, Sam Reifler, Reifler, who was the editor, and an excellent ed editor he was, uh, I got word of the fact that I had these things these mo's, these uh, epigrams, and uh, asked me if, if he <coughs> might get them to him for the issue. Uh, well, I'm a great procrastinator, and, and uh, I suddenly realized it was the next day that the thing went to press. I telephoned Sam. He had a gadget of some kind that would record what I put said over the phone, so I delivered all these over the telephone to Sam's machine. And uh, here, here they are. Uh, and. Uh, I might, by the way, before I get into this, uh, uh, Chandler reading aloud was mentioned. He uh, he said that uh, he, he thought literature should only be read aloud, never any other way. And Victor Victor uh, qu quoted his father's. Uh, explanation of this, of this argument, with the following words of his father's. It's the only way to hear the pluck of the bowstring. <laughs> his, uh, his, his words, his own words were like arrows <laughs> shot at him. <laughs> And you'll hear some of them uh, here. <coughs> Another thing that I got from Victor recently, and, and this is very characteristic of his, of his prose, written prose, and especially of the conversations. And I believe it was it you, Lim, who said that the big thing about Chandler was not his writing or his even reading aloud, it was his conversation. That was the essence of Chandler's genius. It was unbelievable. His use of the English language. He never quoted anybody. He always had unique <coughs> uh, uh, work usages that he made up on the spur of the moment with a tremendous vocabulary. But he, uh, well, let me get started on a few of these and you'll see what I mean. Oh, Victor said in a recent email to me that Pop was a past master of managing surprises. <laughs> <laughs> if you knew him, you would resonate with that. <laughs> and there's and, and with words, every every word was a surprise to you. And that's true of Shakespeare too, I think. And, but uh, here we go. I'll just read them uh, through without much explanation. Uh, by the way, I'll introduce it with what my daughter said when she heard that Chandler had died. She said, no more golden conversation. Mm -hmm. That's a 16-year-old. Mm -hmm. Oh, before I, uh, before I forget this too, the most important thing I can do this evening, uh, 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 beyond telling you about the end of a friend or animal, is <laughs> Barbara mentioned Fergus's book, uh, My Mother's Ghost. I read it right straight through, and it is a breathtaking book. I recommend it about as highly as I could recommend any book I've read for a long time. It's about his mother, his mother's ghost. It's it's. It's heartbreaking and breathtaking. Those are good metaphors, but rather cliche. <coughs> Chandler would not have used hope. He would have done something entirely different. So thank you a thousand times, Fergus. I'll, I'll, I can never make up for your kindness. Uh, but, all right, I'm to, about to get at this. Uh, some of these uh, modes. Let's start with matrimonial. Those having to do with marriage, which... Uh, Ch interested Chandler very much. He had three wives, all extra 
significantly different from each other. Mm. You couldn't have gotten different people if you spent years hunting for them. <laughs> <laughs> Put her in the bow and get behind her with a broom and give her a little persuasion every time she misses a stroke. <laughs> and go to Tierra del Fuego, <laughs> where an earthquake would wake her up. <laughs> she, was, uh, she was near retiring. <laughs> but then on the, on the other hand, Billy Graham. Billy Graham needs a lot of sin in society so he can paddle in it. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> 
describes him. <laughs> now, um, the other, only other one on this page is, uh, let's see, oh yeah, somebody made a very pronounced statement about something. And Sandra said, well, that should shape the weaker members of the congregation. <laughs> <laughs> Now, th th this, these were called Winged Words by Sam Reifler, and he has a superb uh, statement about Chandler on the back page of this. I'm giving you one of these, Barbara, to keep in the, you, you, you can use one of these to you in the Yes. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll just leave this here. And, uh, uh, what, what did I say? What, what did I have to uh, yeah, Well, all right. People. Uh, I, there were some negative ones I just uh, read you. But here's a in-between. <laughs> He's got one foot on a mountain and one in the mud. <laughs> <laughs> and of a, of a woman, she's a mixture of sugar and arsenic. <laughs> <laughs> and then he paused and said, yeah, make mine arsenic. <laughs> Young men, number one, a nice edge to his frisbee. <laughs> number two, and this is one of my family, he's the stomach of the thunderstorm. <laughs> but he said he meant that as a compliment. He admired this character <laughs> because it was like him, I think. And uh, went out <laughs> to my daughter. She came home one day and said, I heard Chandler talking about you. Well, what did he say? Well, he said, you have a, a double, sus wait a minute, what is it, I gotta get it straight. You have a double suspension mind. <laughs> <laughs> what is he, do I? I mean, <laughs> are we able to correct that or, or confirm it? Double suspension mind. <laughs> it's typical of fun, Chandler's conversation. It makes you wonder, what the devil is he, is he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> something important. Um, <laughs> After a concert of young women, uh, uh, he met the young woman who played a solo, and he said, or to the company around him, she got that standing ovation when she threw away her corsage and did the shimmy. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's get out our let's get our Tommy guns, he said one day. <clears throat> and go out and mow down some widows and orphans. <laughs> Very typical. <laughs> uh, things that, uh, how are things going at, at, at Good App, Charlie? Well, uh, there's a, these days there's a lot of motion in the backfield. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, well, his father was dying. This goes back, and Chandler's dog, new dog, was howling, and his mother ordered that it be kept outside. I asked her to take a deep breath and reconsider. <laughs> I find that very touching. <laughs> I met Rod Tipple. He was a 16-year-old, probably at that point. At the hospital, surrounded by nurses, as you described, he was in there. And uh, he said, I felt like the angel Gabriel. I wanted to blow my horn. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, the last, I believe, the last words, his last words were to Jeannie Fleming. Uh, what's her last name now? Uh, you know. still well, still, she still uses that. Oh, does she? All right, Jeannie Fleming, who was with, he was dying. And uh, she was with him, and he was conscious. And he, I, she felt, she understood, he never said anything else for the rest of his life. He, his, his last words were, what's next? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. um, my favorite one-liner here, I have a, a three-part uh, state thing I'll end with. But here's a one-liner, my favorite in a way. And I wish I knew who this person was. Is that good English? <laughs> <laughs> so it's not quite right to me. Yeah, I beg your pardon. Thank you. Um, all right. 
He says not one word that doesn't go with his heart and his star. <laughs> now, the, the, the triple deck one is, I'm the only one I'm going to identify except my son, <laughs> um, is, uh, it, was, it was lunch one summer at Sylvania on the porch, and Margaret Partridge was there. A number of you probably know Margaret Partridge. Now retired on the Cape, she was the librarian at the Ro Roosevelt Library, and uh, a lovely person. And uh, with his body language, like uh, Groucho Marx, who would be proposing something to Margaret Dumont, was that the name of the actress? Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, Mark, uh, he would lean over to <laughs> Margaret's face. Uh, you, you've, <laughs> you've got the finest set of bones I've ever seen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You can run them through your fingers. <laughs> and then he ended up. <coughs> You're like a mermaid. When the tide goes out, you aren't there. <laughs> I saw out of the corner of my eye, and I'm going to end with this, Mar a column by Margaret Schaefer, which I'm not going to read, except it's about Chandler and his language. Chandler and words, what you spoke about them so emphatically. And here's her final sentence, and it's a gem. I think she's a novelist, you know, and works hard on the correct use of words, which is a very difficult thing. I think it came easy to Chandler, by the way. <coughs> right, Liddy? Liddy is my, my assistant. Lydia Christensel will back me up with any. I hear that voice still, wrote Rice Margaret, somehow both tentative and wondering in the face of the mystery of language, as if he were the first man, and to him, is a chance, to him had been given the power of inventing speech. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I don't have a wonderful recollection, but um, I, I do want to um, call your attention to the cover of a recent paperback edition of The House of Mirth by Edith Wharton. On the cover is a color reproduction of the painting of Chandler's mother, Elizabeth, which is also in this article, too, in black and white. Um, this portrait now hangs in the National Museum of American Art, and art historians are fond of referring to that museum as the Enema, the <laughs> N-M-A-A. -A. <laughs> <laughs> the portrait used to hang at Rokeby, I remember there in my childhood. At some point, uh, Chandler got it from you yeah. and brought it to, to Sylvania. Towards the end of his life, I was visiting him one day. I lived across, lived across the road from him in Barrington. And I said, I didn't realize you had the portrait here. I thought it was still in rugby. He said, no, that awful Wendy. <laughs> 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 he wants me to leave it to rugby in my will, but damned if, me, damned if I will. <laughs> <laughs> he left it to the enema. <laughs> <laughs> a very juicy tax break that he wouldn't have gotten otherwise. <laughs> and it looks great there, uh, where it ought to be. In the back there. Um, I, I brought along just a tiny uh, Chandler tell me, tell me artifact. Name. Yeah. My name is Robert Preston. I'm here as the, the husband of Lydia Preston. <laughs> and uh, an old friend of Chandler. But first, I, I just wanted to say one, one uh, line of Chandler's uh, about Saul Bellow, uh, completely uh, extempore. Uh, he, he said uh, that, that Bellow, uh, the trouble with him is that he thinks he's on figure skates when he's really on snowshoes. When he reached into uh, a, 
draw, having chose, or to choose just pulled out at random um, this little uh, bit of, uh, of memorabilia here, uh, based on uh, the idea, she says, that uh, Chandler was always Chandler. No matter what he was doing, it always fully expressed it. It had this uh, enormous Chandlerness uh, about it. And, and this, uh, in contrast to uh, what Buzz uh, read out, um, of course, we, we were not prescient enough to, to keep notes about all the wonderful things he said because we never had the idea that they would, would stop. We thought of him as a force of nature. Um, <laughs> A, a tempestuous force of nature. He, he would come wonderfully barreling into the house, bellowing. Um, it, it terrified my small niece. She hid under the dining room table <laughs> at his approach. But there, these are um, just uh, tiny little uh, business notes, marginalia, um, quite literally. Uh, this, this one scrawled in his wonderful free form scrawl uh, on, on the back of, of a letter that we had sent him, which we got back. Um, and uh, this one simply says that it re returned some photographs from a party that we've been at and says, some of the guests uh, at a joint party of the Harvard and Radcliffe clubs at Rokeby, the home of the minor Aldriches. <laughs>
one time Chan was a uh, chauffeur, and uh, I was, it was suggested, um, I was living in uh, Ryan at that time, and someone told me that Chan needed a chauffeur, so I called him up and I said, I would like to offer my services, and he said, oh fine, that would be lovely. And so we arranged a date, and I was to pick him up at about 11 o'clock on, say, a Monday morning. <clears throat> so I went over to Good Hap, and he came out, all dressed up, and he had on his hat and his overcoat. And he got in the car, and he said to me, where do you want to go? <laughs>
to death by night. The mountains have allowed shadows to come and cover us in shade. We drink to Bim. He's past his 50th year. Bim looks so young, although his hair is white. His, his wife is lovely. Eve is debonair. Drink to them both. That whiskey unalloyed by lithiated water flow tonight. <laughs> Chandler about it, and in comes the deputy who's been checking the homes also. And he says to the deputy, Call off the hounds. He says, It's a baby faced bandit. He said, Only <laughs> 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 recently I asked my brother, Are you known as a baby faced bandit? He said, No, but that's just a spur of the moment. <laughs> share my last memory, one of my last wonderful memories of Chandler. My, my, our daughter went to live in New York and I inherited her little old mare, Feather. And we used to, we were allowed to drive all around the beautiful drives of Slovenia in those days. And every time I come back from the post office in the morning walking, I see Chandler's beautiful row of of cedars that have become very high, which were sheltering his swimming pool uh, in his in the wonderful days of good hat that Chandler was left alive. And I think of Chandler instantly every morning. And one day we were, Feather and I were, were cantering around the lovely drives of, Sil of Sylvania, and we decided we'd cut across the swimming pool and go down another drive. And uh, we came upon a figure, <laughs> a swimming pool. There was Chandler in the nude, reading the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. <laughs> <laughs> Sunset in Baraka, and I think of Chandler, because I, I again I was riding Feather up around Goodhap and hitching out her up to the front door at sunset. Always in his latter days, Chandler would be out if it wasn't with with Blow, <laughs> and sometimes it was. <laughs> he was having his evening drink at sunset. So I like Chandler tonight. seasons with Chandler. 
the fall of 1980 and the winter of 1981. And during that time, uh, I had been a, a substitute teacher in New York, and one of my students I helped get into Bard on a HEOP scholarship. And this young black boy was the only one in this family who didn't go to jail, but instead went to Bard. <laughs> while he was at Bard, he, uh, he had a French girlfriend. It turned out that this French girlfriend's grandfather was a friend of John J. Chapman, and also Chandler knew this Louis character. And so the two of them came for dinner one night at Goodham, and while we were sitting, he was sitting, Chandler was at the end of the table, and the two students were on his right, and I was on the left, and at a certain point, he, he said to me, going like this toward in my direction, and said, living with her is like living in a monsoon of words. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> You were the one to tell me about the first John Pellin. Nice right. Chapter. It turns out that when I, I went to Bard for a year in 54, 55, and I <coughs> commuted up in the 60s, but in the, the first time around, one of my classmates turned out to babysit for Victor. And her name was Elsa. And she told me that uh, Helen told her that the first time she saw Chandler, he was floating on his back in a pool smoking a cigar. <laughs> she fell in love with him instantly. <laughs> well, I was on, a, on that terrible school board with Chandler. <laughs> and I don't think I have seen him. <laughs> Pete, how long did you last on the board? Well, he was on there for four years. Yeah, yeah sure. He, we had a meeting one night, at, and, and Chandler, we were arguing, and Chandler kept us there till 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and I had to go home and, and get up the next morning at 5 o'clock and milk the cows. And five minutes after I started milking him, walks Chandler. <laughs> <laughs> I assure you, he got an earful before he left. <laughs> <laughs> he was there, wasn't he, Pete, during the, um, uh, it was a real terrible four years on the school board then. You were, the Thompson problem, do you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. And he, he offered the, uh, Norm Thompson offered property to the school to build a new school, and it was all, and it was, it was, um, it was, it was Ted, a whole Ted, Ted Thompson. Ted Thompson. Ted Thompson. Ted Thompson. Yeah. Head? Yeah. Oh, it wasn't um, Fran Thompson's no, husband. No, no. no. Okay, yes, that's right. It was yeah. not upper right now. And anyway, it was rejected, right? And there was all kinds of controversy about oh, his yeah. reason. They dug a hole, and some of the people said it was full of water, and some of the people said it was completely dry. <laughs> <laughs> Something sounds familiar about that. It's just what he would do. Yeah. 
<laughs> Jay, is that, the, is that your, your mother? Or is no, it? Ida. <laughs> Ida. Ida. <laughs> Ida. Oh, Ida. Oh, is it the end? No. Then I guess he made faces at her through the. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a nice story. This is wife number three. I, I, I have one, I have a story that really is almost out of order, but not quite as <laughs> uh, Chandler had a, a, a certain formality uh, of manners, you know, and he liked to do things correctly. And when he was engaged to Ida, uh, he thought it was proper for him to bring her round for tea to introduce her his relations and neighbors and so on, and he called to see if he could bring her to tea, and he brought her over to our house, and we had tea. And uh, then uh, Ida and Evie were still inside talking about something, and Chandra and I were out in the parking lot in the driveway, and, and, and uh, he said, what do you think of her? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, well, they were both in their late 70s, I think at the time. And uh, I said, well, I mean, she seemed perfectly nice, I said, but I, I don't really understand why you want to marry her. <laughs> and he said, God, you're stupid. <laughs> uh, I said, well, why is it? Well, she's been divorced for 17 years. <laughs> oh, I said, what's so great about that? <laughs> God, you're dumb! <laughs> Just think of it, what a hunk of virginity! <laughs> somewhere down the river, he, he got very excited and, and he said, you must come home to my house, I want to show you my house, and since she lived up, up in Columbia County, was on her way, all right, she said, and uh, it was it was a full moon by the time they arrived in Sylvania, and of course, he wasn't then living in Sylvania, but that wasn't the point that he wanted to register with her, so they drove up the front drive, and, well, what do you think, here it is, and, he, and, she, and I said, what did you think, Ida, and I, I said, what could I think? The frog had turned into a prince! <laughs> Robert, who died four years ago, 
why his birthday was almost coincidental with that for Pa, and rage was part of Robert's personality too. But uh, Grandma was a wonderful person, and she, when I was very, very little boy, why she had this great big huge Cadillac with little seats that flopped out in front of the back seat, and William Rosborough used to take us out for drives through the countryside and whatnot. And she taught us all kinds of songs. And the one song that I will inflict on you, it's a very short song that had been taught to her by her nanny when she was a very little girl. And her nanny, I subsequently learned from Chandler, was uh, Jane Shepherd, who is buried in the little cemetery that's immediately behind the IGA market. And I thought enough of, of Grandma and Jane Shepherd so that I went in and hunted it up and it's there. And so the little, the little lullaby goes like this that was taught to her by Great Jane Shepherd. Cheep, cheep, cheepy daddy, playing in the moonlight, no one for to see. The boys and girls have gone away, they've had their playtime in the day. Now the world is left to me. Cheep, cheep, cheepy daddy. And it's a lullaby, you just sing it round and round and round. And round, and round. There was all kinds of other songs too that I won't burden you with now. But I hunted up the books that she got them out of and I have quite a few of them. But then, uh, later on after Grandma had died, I told Papa about how Grandma had taught us all these songs and why didn't he ever teach us any songs? And he said, well, all right, I'll teach you a song. And uh, it's in French, but you've studied French, so you can know it. And subsequently, many years later, I dug up the book that he'd gotten it out of, and it came from not France, not, not uh, Canada, but uh, Louisiana. <laughs> I'll only sing the first verse of it because it's all in French. Quand j'étais chez ma mère, petite Jeanne de temps, le plein blanc blanc, mon voit à la fontaine pour remplir mon bouchon. Oh, la vie bonnoise, sans se déploie, déploie, des herbes, des herbes d'oignons, n'y a-t-il pas de la glan blanc blanc, bon bon bon, bon bon bon, d'arion, d'arion, d'arion. Oh, la gargare sans vie bonnoise, faisons le saut de la gargare sans vie bonnoise. The, the whole song is really chorus, and there's just one little introductory line at the beginning. <laughs> but since it's all in French, I'm not going to burden you with any more of conversation informally. We have um, decaf coffee and juice and uh, lots of other tasties and Shirley and Mary are pleased to serve you all and I thank you all for coming. I think it's been a wonderful tribute to our Chandler Chapman who will be an endless source of stories I'm sure as long as this generation's alive and maybe the next generation that follows. Thank you all for coming.